Okay, well, thank you very much, everyone, for coming to our next session. I'm very excited that we have both Nicole Carms and Deli Matteo Babiano joining us um, for this session. So this session is under the title of Action in the Field, Feminist Practice. I should take a step back and firstly introduce myself. I'm Anna Huleman. I'm a senior lecturer in urban planning here at Melbourne University, and I'm also the Assistant Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and have been involved in organising this um, conference with Justine and, and Julie. So this next session will be talking about equity and transport. So I guess the provocation for this theme is thinking about how practitioners and researchers help create more equitable built environments which welcome and support those that are underrepresented and disadvantaged in our community. So this focus is on equity and transport. So what I'm going to do is firstly introduce our two speakers, then they're going to spend about 15 minutes each presenting some of their work, both research and practice. And then we'll have a 15, roughly 15 minute um, or so conversation and then open it up to questions from the audience. So just to give you a, a bit of a um, information on the running of that se of the session today. So Dr. Nicole Carms, she's an associate professor in the Department of Design and the founding director of the Monash University XYX Lab. The XYX Lab operates at the intersections of gender, identity, urban space and advocacy bringing together planners, policy makers, government and stakeholders to make tangible the experiences of underrepresented communities in urban space. She's the author of Hypersexual City, The Provocation of Softcore Urbanism, which was published by Rootledge in 2017. She regularly writes um, for a diverse um, non-academic audience and is frequently invited to also speak to the public about sexuality and urban space at major national and international cultural institutions. So thank you for being here and sharing your knowledge with us today. We also have my colleague, Derli Matteo Babiano. Dr. Derli Matteo Babiano is a senior lecturer in urban planning here at the University of Melbourne. She's an architect, urban planner, and also transport planner. She leads the Women in Transport Leadership in Australia Knowledge Network, which is dedicated to empowering women and developing a critical mass of future transport leaders in Australia and Australasia. Durley's research explores how the intersections of, uh, of people, land use, and transport create specific transport mobility and accessibility challenges and opportunities for positive place-based changes. She investigates the influence of built environment on transport participation and argues that encouraging behavioural shifts to active forms of transport is vital to achieving more sustainable and inclusive cities. Thank you, Dirli. I know how busy you are for, for coming here today. So what it's we'll do yeah, um, is we'll, we'll start. I think, Nicole, you're going first. I'm going to take a seat back down here to watch the presentation, but we'll come back up for, yep. for the conversation later. Okay. Thanks, Anna. So um, thanks, everybody, for being in this session. This afternoon, I'm going to be speaking about uh, public transport and the XYX Lab's um, recent, very new project in Victoria to really think about how we're understanding the experiences of women and girls in Victorian public transport spaces. But I'm just going to start with a short video. <laughs> This was one of my first times out clubbing. My friends and I were on a train and I was with a girl and we were being pretty affectionate. Out of nowhere, a man took a couple of steps towards us and started yelling really angrily, aggressively, really aggressively, looking for a confrontation. I didn't know what to think. In that moment, I was really aware he was targeting us because we were all gay and because I was a woman with another woman and it just made me feel terrified and hopeless because I had assumed that I would be safe out in public with my friends, but clearly I'm not. So 
So the Monash University XYX Lab are a research laboratory dedicated to thinking about this complex nexus of gender and place. And we're an interdisciplinary research team and over the past few years we've been developing expertise and relationships in the public transport sector. And our purpose here is to really think about how um, our, I guess, our silos in architecture, in urban planning, are really changing in purpose. And so we really are thinking about how interdisciplinarity kind of starts to shape the ways that we might practice both as practitioners but also as researchers. Um, we are a team of 10 researchers and the work that I'm talking about this afternoon is the kind of accumulation of all of those different people coming together to form the XYX Lab. I'm going to be saying the, the word woman a lot this afternoon and I do want to just notice that women are not a homogenous group, that they do represent enormous diversity um, in their socioeconomic background, in um, their sexuality, their ability and their age. And when the research that we're undertaking at the XYX Lab does include um, cis women but also trans women and intersex women and that is the kind of um, fullness of the use of the word women. And to that end, I think that one of the key things that the XYX Lab addresses more broadly is the fact that uh, for many women, the limitations of their freedom and participation in public life is really about managing the violence of men. And so um, this particular research that I'm sharing with you around public transport is also a, uh, a category of larger research that we're doing in public place. And we... Um, undertake this research with a range of different partners and organisations. We're working with architectural practices, we work a lot with local government organisations, with the Victorian state government, with uh, NGOs, and really it's always about this relationship of thinking about how we can include uh, the voices of diverse communities, so whether it's women and girls or the LGBTIQ community, in thinking about how we can shape public place. And with regard to public transport, I think there's a really critical thing that we're trying to understand with our partners, and that is that there's a lot of research around um, crime statistics, stuff that gets reported um, to police, but there's a huge gap in what goes unreported. And really this has a lot to do with really understanding women's very complex experiences of urban places and spaces, but it's also about this idea of the perception of safety, which for every woman is a very complex thing to navigate. Uh, and it relates to her previous experiences, it relates to any kind of safety measures she may have taken, it relates to things that she's heard in the media, to things that she's um, discussed with friends. And so it's a very complex thing to think about in terms of perceptions of safety, and it plays out in a really particular way in public transport spaces. So um, I think one of the things that has kind of led to our emphasis in public transport has been the work that we've been doing both locally and internationally around this idea of what makes a place unsafe or bad. And to kind of jump to the end story, what we discovered is that public transport spaces are one of the worst places for women and girls um, internationally. So you can see a slide here that is showing you the experiences of sexual harassment in um, Delhi, Kampala, Lima, Madrid and Sydney. This is across five continents and what dominates young women's experience is their experiences of sexual harassment. Um, in all of those cities except Kampala, where women are at risk for their life more than they are at risk of suffering from sexual harassment. So there's something incredibly interesting about understanding that across those very diverse cultures, women are having the same experience. And so apart from the street, where women are managing sexual harassment all the time, um, public transport is the typology that follows in terms of negative or bad experiences, unsafe experiences for women and girls. And this is the data from um, Sydney in 2018. And I think alongside um, sexual harassment, what we start to understand is that there are other behavioural issues like unpredictable people, people that are drug affected, of course, these people are on public transport as well, but that there are kind of um, material things that start to impact women and girls. So the nature of the infrastructure, lighting, things that certainly architecture and urban design are very much in control of. In our foundational research in 2016 here in Melbourne, what we were able to start to see is the ways that women were starting to describe public transport spaces. And they said things like, 
stations are safe, but the areas around them are unsafe, the infrastructure to get to them are unsafe, um, some of the lines in their entirety are unsafe. And so we had some clues about what was happening here in Victoria in terms of public transport with that research from a couple of years ago. And I think we used that um, foundational research to actually leverage this new project, TramLab, which we've been undertaking for the majority of this year and um, it will continue into next year. And it's a research project that is in collaboration with La Trobe University and RMIT. Uh, and it's the whole of Victoria, even though it's called TramLab, it is the whole of Victoria, all systems, all public transport, trains, trams, buses. So we are charged with really thinking about how we can understand the safety issues faced by women and girls um, across Victoria. And many of you, of course, know Jill Mathewson, who's a key um, senior research fellow in the XYX lab, and she's been undertaking a lot of the foundational research um, and international survey of best practice across um, uh, places like Scandinavia, of course, but also in um, developing countries to see what are the things that are evidence-based that may uh, indeed change the situation that we're faced with here in Victoria. And I think that what we very quickly came to understand is that this isn't a new issue and researchers have been writing about uh, public transport and gender inequity for over 50 years in terms of um, really trying to understand how we might impact gendered experiences of public transport. And so part of our question is, why are we still here? Why are we still struggling with this? Uh, and we have a few clues around people's anxiety to want to deal with gender issues in urban place and space, uh, and a general lack of empathy around these issues. We also know that public transport is dominated um, even more so than urbanism and architecture by men and a, a kind of reliance on technology and, and a and a tech kind of thinking. So we're really kind of very challenged with the work that we need to do. We're also very conscious of um, a recent report by Carolyn Witzman from UniMelb, uh, who really noticed the very complex situation that we have here in Victoria. So it's a very uncoordinated railway system in Victoria. There's over 16 stakeholders and there is no reporting or accountability around um, sexual harassment and violence against women on the service. There's no kind of unified way of thinking about that. So again, a very challenging um, place and, and research project for us to be undertaking. And so we know that we're very interested in spatial factors, but we absolutely can't remove that from the behavioural factors that um, come together in very crowded, um, and this image is the very crowded, but also the very desolate and, and, and isolated spaces of public transport. And so our aims is to really uh, extend the emerging evidence from international best practice, uh, and to do that through thinking about how we can improve the safety of women and girls. It's, as you know, a, as I've said, a multi-agency, multi-university project, but it's based in action research. So we're actually using the transport system itself um, and working alongside women and girls in um, uh, speculative co-design methods to really think about how we can start to understand the very particular Victorian context. The XYX Lab have a, I guess, a, a, a raft of things that we do in urban places and spaces, and we've been developing that so it can align with the work that we're doing in public transport spaces. And listening and, and advocating and having, having women and girls at the table with policymakers is an absolute core part of the work that we do, and you'll see that in a minute when I show you the co-design activities. Applying a gendered lens is absolutely imperative. Thinking about gender sensitive training and mandating that for the people that work and operate public transport systems. Understanding what it means to be a bystander, which is an incredibly complex thing. It's not just about stepping in and stepping up. There are lots of other factors which influence that. Better reporting and really our aim is to develop a set of design guidelines that can be actioned here in Victoria as a toolkit. The team is kind of very interesting in that it covers a lot of the things that I'm talking about. So it covers the fact that access to public transport is a health issue. Um, it covers the fact that a lot of the work we need to do is around communication and really clearly communicating expectations in public transport spaces. We also have people who are working in digital advocacy, um, in, in activism, uh, in spatial practice, in speculative design. So all of these people are a key kind of factor in making this project take shape. 
And then the stakeholders, the people that we're working alongside in our co-design activities include um, women who are very active in feminist practice, but also the stakeholders themselves, the service providers, um, women PT users, local government and policy makers, urban planners, designers, many of you here today are going to be at um, some of the co-design activities that we're running, our team, and then key influences in this area. And what we do is we bring all of these different people with very different views of exactly the same problem together into a co-design process. And we'll do this several times, but we have a very enormous one coming up next week where the user, the researcher and the designer come together. And this diagram is kind of showing them as a kind of um, non-hierarchical designing process. But actually, I think uh, a better way to describe it is that the designer, the expert, gets demoted for the day, and the woman, the, 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 the females with, with lived experience, they actually get elevated as experts in this co-design process. And so it looks a little bit like this, with lots of bespoke materials, people who don't see themselves as designers actually then coming together to solve problems, in this case around public transport issues. Um, there's a lot of use of personas, of thinking about what how stories kind of play out and how they influence design. There's a lot of discussion. There's a lot of making. Uh, and, and we code all of this data. We look at all of the solutions to produce kind of findings uh, and to continue the processes that we work with. We're specifically looking at um, communication campaigns, of which we've seen a few over the last year, around public transport. We're thinking and working with reporting tools, with gender safety audits that can be deployed on public transport spaces. A critical key issue is CCTV, which is really relied upon in public transport space, but has very little evidence um, as a kind of feminist or gender sensitive tool, as well as surveillance and AI. Um, PSOs are a core part of women's safety and we're really thinking very carefully about the, what works about PSOs and what is actually quite problematic. We're thinking about female-focused transportation, which isn't just about the user's experience, but also how we can elevate um, the experience of, of drivers and people that work for the public transport service providers because the inequity within those organisations actually reflects what's happening on the outside in terms of customer service. And of course, we're thinking about transport design. And the idea is, is that there's a kind of probable place where we're moving towards if we just stay where we are. If we just kind of keep going, we kind of can predict the shitty experience that's going to continue to happen for women and girls on public transport spaces. But if we can think very carefully about what the evidence base is internationally, apply it to the Victorian context, then we can start to um, move towards a, a, a preferable future that can can tweak some of the things that are um, ahead of us. And I think that uh, one of the key things that we need to do is to be optimistic about this particular um, typology and the, the challenges faced in public transport spaces, but also we have to acknowledge that it's a really long game. So this um, particular tram, which is the recent art tram you may have seen out and about, um, and I'm sure you'll spot it, if you, if you haven't seen it yet, is the Yours, Mine, Ours tram, and it's designed by my co-director, Jean Borden. And it's really about describing a shared responsibility that we all have for thinking about public transport design and spaces and places. Um, and thinking not just about the material of public transport, but also about the policies, the behaviours, the expectations, and the accountability that we all need to share. So stay tuned for Tram Lab, um, and um, in the next 12 months you'll be seeing the kind of media face of the project, the prototyping, the recommendations, the toolkits, the launches of those toolkits, which you'll all be invited to, and um, some stuff to share back. Thank you. Thank you, that was good. Okay. Yeah. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, it, I'll be talking about equity in transport as well, but probably from a more, uh, from a different setting. So a geograph different geographical setting. A lot of my research has been on um, Australasia, mainly Asia before, but then since I moved here, I've kind of in, um, encompassed as well, um, you know, Australian uh, Australian research. Okay. So I'm Dirty Mateo Babiano, as I've introduced earlier. So to start, good afternoon, everyone. At the close of the 19th century, the feminist 
Susan B. Anthony spoke about the emancipatory role of cycling um, for women. So according to her, cycling gives women a sense of freedom and self-reliance. Um, yet 120 years later, women's fundamental right and freedom to move in her own terms, particularly to access opportunities and other socially valued community resources, re remains elusive. Uh, thank you very much, Anna, for inviting me here um, to share this time and space with all of you um, who are you know, um, very much into um, addressing women's um, special injustice in, in, in cities. And today, what I'm going to do is I am here to tell my own story about my lived experience in being a female user as well as researcher um, in several Asian cities. So the main aim really of this, uh, the purpose of this uh, talk is really to weave together snapshots of women's travel behavior to portray a more holistic account of the changing nature of women's travel in selected Asian cities. And as you know, half of the uh, Asian population, and of course globally, 50% are women. However, we have persistently experienced exclusion because of a gender-blind approach to transport planning. So we assume that transport is gender neutral. And particularly in Asia, when I was trying to understand the travel behavior of Asian females, um, was the lack of gender disaggregated data which differentiate how women experience transport differently from their male counterpart, and how this difference have changed over time. And because of this lack of data, it makes it difficult to, be, uh, to make well-informed decision to, say, to shape more gender responsive and more inclusive transport system for all. So in this presentation, I will be using and drawing upon Hickman's classification of transport users, so a generic transport user, which I argue could also embody those in other developing cities. So this is for Metro Manila, where I am originally from, um, as a jump off point to confirm my own lived experience across different life stages. So the transport public, um, the public transport advocate, the individualistic car driver, the frustrated traveler, as well as the comfort-seeking traveler. So Hickman described the public transport advocate as someone who depends on public transport for their daily mobility. So like 50%, 80% of the Philippine population, as I was growing up, my own mobility was catered for by the suite of formal, but more significantly, informal transport in the two neighborhoods I, I grew up in. So the photo on the right is Tacloban City, which is in the Visayan region in the central part of the Philippines. Um, you can see from that photo that there are tricycles as well as jeepneys. Not sure if this works. So that's a jeepney, and this is a tricycle. Um, on the left side, sorry, on the right, on your right side, um, you would see this is in Metro Manila where I was. Um, going uh, where, where I was an undergraduate student at the University of the Philippines. So during my growing up years until I came to Australia, my family and as well as myself did not own a car and I didn't know how to drive. I, because of you know, the, the ubiquity of uh, public transport, both formal and informal, I didn't really need to learn how to drive because basically the informal transport um, provided that need for mobility. I also lived in um, Bandung, Bangkok, and Tokyo as part of my um, formative professional life, I guess. And formal trains, buses, and taxis, as well as informal angkot, ojek, and bechaks were embedded in the transport landscape. In, um, and this, in these cities, enabling access to opportunities, particularly for women. In fact, um, a survey done by Hyodo et al. asked respondents to, about their different modal choices. And in each of those cities, respondents mentioned up to 20 modal types. As Yuteng, as Yuteng in her study reports, many countries are characterized by availability of paratransit systems, like taxis, auto rickshaws, non-motorized rickshaws, etc which served the needs of women to a greater extent. However, these modes do not form part of the mainstream government-run transport planning policies and programs. 
in, and in my own study, I did research, conduct a, stud, a survey on female jeepney users to understand their lived experience and the purpose of using the jeepney. I also commuted by myself by the time I turned nine, something that would be frowned upon, especially with rising parental chauffeuring here in Australia. My mother would bring me to school on her way to work, and we usually pass by a bake shop to buy my snacks. In the afternoon, she would fetch me. Sometimes we would walk my best friend to her home near, my, near our school, and we would then take the jeepney home. You see, women typically generated more trips and chained their trips at, as what my mother did and what I did as a mom too. Yet, this is not captured when we model transportation. This figures compares the trip generation rate of men and women in different age groups. So these are four selected cities in Asia. So Jakarta, Kuala Lumpur, Manila, um, I'm not sure what's the, Chengdu. And so in, in this study, the authors inferred that, so the red one is the female uh, ge trip generation rate and blue is the male trip generation rate. As you can see, except for Kuala Lumpur, uh, men in most cities um, had lower trip generation rate than women. And for KL, it was inferred by the author that gender norms were the large influence um, in this trip generation rate, so religion and culture. And you could also see that, so the one out in the outer part of the web are, are, the, age, are the age group, and then the ones the radial lines going into that direction would be the trip generation rate. So you could see 1.7, 1.8, 1.9, etc. So you could see that when women, uh, when people turned from uh, 20 years old, going into the 50 year old uh, bracket, more, women tended to have higher trip generation rate. So you could definitely infer that there are different um, activities that women uh, participate in that led them to take or to have more trips generated. So as I've mentioned earlier, women in their 20s and 50s generate more trips than their male counterparts. Yet, this is not captured within the modeling of transportation. Another study by Nang and Acker illustrated that domestic responsibilities in Southeast Asian cities has not changed significantly in the past years, few years. And it shows that men are making more commute trips while women are making more non-commute trips. And they travel, women travel during non-peak period. So obviously you can see from these different figures that definitely there is a gendering in, in our travel behavior. So there is a difference in travel behavior between men and women. However, because of the assumption that transportation and how we plan, uh, transportation is, is, a, is a gender neutral system, how we plan for transport sometimes um, discriminate one gender over the other. Another category is a frustrated traveler, someone conveying a strong sense of disappointment on the state of transport. So, Philippines, as the third most congested conurbation in Southeast Asia, the stress associated with commuting in Metro Manila particularly has been part of the lived experience of its residents, including myself. Similar to the photo on the right, I have personal experience being stuck in traffic for three hours. So, on your right, yeah. Along that same highway, which is EDSA, it's a um, uh, circumferential road, plying a 21 kilom kilometer distance after a heavy rain. So it started from 9 p.m. I arrived um, where I was staying at 12.30 in the morning. Similar um, because of the heavy rains. Or lining up for five hours yeah, on your left, just to be able to enter the light rail transit waiting platform. So another experience, lived experience in the public transport back in the Philippines. So in a global uh, comparative study led by Professor Vanya Sekaris and Professor Anastasia Lokaito uh, Sideris, which I am honored to be part of, I focus my examination on the sexual victimization experience by college students in Manila. So that is the same study that uh, Professor Carolyn Weitzman did here in Melbourne, while I did the one in, um, in Metro Manila as well as in um, Indonesia. 
I found that the experience of sexual violence and harassment of either verbal, nonverbal, or physical is deeply gendered across the three transport environments. So when we say uh, transport environment, it actually encompasses both uh, the walking, waiting, or riding environments. So for instance, you can see from this figure on the right is the walking environment, the waiting environment, and the riding environment. And you can see it um, across compared to gender. And you can see that um, in the, within the walking environment, such as going to and from the bus stop, women experience verbal harassment, mainly whistling. Men, on the other hand, experience non-verbal harassment, mainly stalking and unwanted sexual looks or gestures. And so this difference in experience of the same um, you know, built environment is, is very interesting to unravel. So another type is the individualistic car driver. A strong supporter, um, as Hickman mentioned, um, defined, it's a strong supporter of new infrastructure for highways as a means of providing more space for cars to address congestion. As I've mentioned earlier, I didn't know how to drive, right? So it's just in Australia that I actually learned how to. But um, what is interesting is understanding what motivates car buying intentions in Asia, Asian countries. So this study um, in Asia looked at Diff both male and female, and their intention to buy cars, and what was motivating them to buy that car. So what would be interesting is that there's an equal force of future buyers in... So as you can see in Europe, um, I can see it here, it's always equal, 40-something uh, and 50-something. Sorry, I can't see it clearly here. Um, yes, yeah, so in China, 55% men versus 45% percent women, and Thailand, 52% um, men versus 48% women. So understanding what motivates them to, to buy cars in the next year or so is important in terms of how do we advance sustainable transport within the cities. Yeah. So uh, 10 years ago, as an Australian immigrant, that's actually when I learned how to drive a car. The reason why I had to learn how to drive and buy my own car was mainly for practical uh, purposes. I needed to pick up my daughters from daycare and school when I was back in Queensland, and my transport needs were not well supported by the current public transport system wherein all public transport has to go to the CBD and then out again. And for a distance of six kilometers, it took me an hour and a half because of congestion just on that day. And I have resolved to learn how to drive a car. So the fourth type is the comfort-seeking traveler. This one places utmost importance to specific attributes of transport, such as convenience, comfort, and the possibility of, uh, and possibility of productivity whilst traveling. So this is interesting because as we move into you know, a more autonomous vehicle-focused world, um, we, would, we could imagine uh, the, the, the possibility of actually um, all the vehicles being autonomous and the intent to purchase autonomous vehicles would be increasing. But looking at Asia, um, what we are looking here and sorry, is quite different from what we are looking at um, Asia, wherein we're looking at digital disruptors um, that may alter behaviors and cultures. And in a way, it is being hypothesized to better respond to women's needs. However, when we were looking at um, its adoption and uptake in different economies, so for example, ride sharing, um, the use of um, digital... Um, digital disruptors, for instance, um, uh, apps, were not really as high as we would expect. And the reason for that is really the low internet penetration as well as smartphone ownership within these this cities, these countries. So for instance, in India, only 11% um, is, uh, has access to internet, Indonesia only 22%, Philippines 32%, Thailand 30%, and Vietnam 38, 34%. So it's, it's, it's quite low. Right? So anyway, I've used Tickman's classification of transport users um, as a way to understand travel behavior and the changing travel patterns within Asian cities. And I think it was useful in reflecting it um, using my own lived experience. 
I have shown, I hope I have shown that this, that the lived experience can be an important data set to deepen our understanding of women's travel behavior, maybe not just in Asian, in the Asian context, but also here in Australasia. So, but the challenge remains. The importance of having a robust gender disaggregated data set remains an important first step in, uh, to gain a more nuanced and fundamental understanding of gender disparity in transport within the Asian context. So what proportion of the population have access to public transport, both formal and informal? How many have reported being victim of sexual violence? As um, Nicole's presentation earlier, we see that in, in Asia, as well as in other regions, there's really that high um, reporting of sexual harassment and victimization. But what's the figure? How do we allocate our public open spaces in our city? If we don't, you know, understand and learn these figures, it would be very difficult for us to come up with a more gender responsive um, way to address issues and challenges within our public transport city cities, ergo the whole city. So going back to what the American civil rights leader Susan B. Anthony said in 1896, I rejoice every time I see a woman ride by on a bike. It gives her a feeling of self-reliance and independence the moment she takes her seat and away she goes. The picture of untrammeled womanhood. Our desire as women, our desire to freely choose our own mobility is as current today as it was during uh, Miss Anthony's time a century ago. So it is a challenge for me and for everyone to use our own research as a platform for, for positive change. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jelly and Nikki, um, for, for those really wonderful presentations that will hopefully launch a, a great discussion now. We've, we've got about 15 minutes for us to, to talk. Um, was there anything that you wanted to, to build on from, from what you've seen in each other's presentations? Um, or make any commentary about that? Or should we head straight into to questions? I'm happy to head straight into questions, but yep. I, I thought that um, there were lots of kind of generalisations that I kind of covered over, and thank you for like um, being really specific about some of those things, because hopefully that was useful. Mm. Yep. Absolutely. So for me, I saw a lot of complementary things within the presentation. For instance, I've uh, dealt on public transport uh, safety, so the transit safety issue, and I saw that you know um, how it could be uh, looked at or examined at the micro scale. So for instance, the you know the walking environment and access to the and riding environment, and how those experiences are actually very different. Mm. And if we are ev ever able to understand at the micro, uh, this uh, issue or phenomenon at the micro scale, it would be easier to provide some solutions at the interim as well as long term. Absolutely. Yeah. And as a planner, <laughs> I sat there thinking about how much of this is about the design of our cities and the spatial arrangement of land use um, within that. And really, from your personal experience, Dirley, in the cities that you've lived in, how that enables a sustainable transport use mm. or, or not, and particularly quite saddened by the fact that once you came to Australia, that's when you needed to, <laughs> to learn to, to drive a car and use a car. So I, it got me really thinking about how important this is on so many different levels, policy, yeah. planning, and also the way we as a society treat women in public spaces, which I think your talk, Nikki, in particular, um, really demonstrated. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think we should open for questions so that we can um, really respond to issues that you want to discuss and the questions that you have for our speakers. Any questions so far? Yep, down here. I've got a question in regards to the use of CCTV and um, facial recognition um, as a tool to um, prevent violence. And I was just interested in your uh, opinions on 
that sort of technology? Well, the we, we've done um, uh, a fair bit of research on the efficacy of CCTV camera from both women's perspectives, but also really looking quite deeply at um, uh, yeah how how effective it is. And so I think for a long time. Uh, they have thought that CCTV camera does deter crime, but actually that evidence is quite thin. Uh, but certainly the research we've done with women and girls is um, telling us that CCTV TV camera just makes them feel less safe. So that's kind of really interesting. And we think, we can speculate that that's for a couple of reasons. So we think that it's because it's a forensic tool. So when we see um, lots of gender-based crimes that happen in the media, it's always through the lens of this kind of CCTV camera, which women really carry that with them when they're navigating public space, those kind of images. And so they see the camera and they think, there's a reason for me to feel unsafe. Uh, and so it's that kind of, again, perceptions of safety. But also, if you combine that with the fact that it doesn't have a very good evidence base, and it's the absolute main thing that local councils are doing all the time with great expense, we should be very concerned about that. I mean, I just think together, there's a massive rethinking needs to happen. And the reliance on it that we hear from our local government associations is just huge. So um, I think it's incredibly problematic and we hope that we'll be able to really kind of proof that we need to think of better solutions. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> but just to add to that, I think, um, yeah, I do agree. That the research shows that it's really thin on how, um, because I, I think that, I, I agree that there is a, a huge reliance on it because it's easier to measure and capture, right? But also understanding holistically what kind of city do we in, do we aspire to have? I think it's, the, it's a better question. And if we have that question, if it's a safe city, if it's a city for everyone, then we could have, um, I think, a more robust solution, not just you know addressing safety, but addressing how could we have a better city for everyone, inclusive, safe, um, resilient, and how does it look like? And definitely it would address safety, but at the same time, all the other um, you know, um, aspirations we have as a, as a city, as a society. I think there was another question here in the middle. Yeah. Hello, thank you both for sharing your presentations. Um, I had a question around how you define the different types of harassment or assault that happens in public transport and also the bigger question of uh, the number of assaults or the types that um, go unrecorded or mm. that go um, unspoken about, um, particularly in, in kind of systems that don't acknowledge certain types of assaults versus others as, you know, on a hierarchy level type situation. So how do you kind of get around those sorts of problems? We, um, uh, so I just showed you that one uh, data set across those five cities, but actually we have mined each of those cities very carefully. I have talked a lot about that research um, at a couple of different parlour things, and so I was trying to direction things towards something new. But, for example, um, and Jill, who's sitting in front of you, you can discuss this happy topic over drinks, but we know, for example, that catcalling is, as, is actually as high as being stalked. Um, and that happens a lot and that women are actually um, managing then if they decide to call back to some kind of what seems to be just a bit of fun catcalling then things escalate quite seriously and quite quickly and so um, and, and women don't necessarily know when something's going to escalate so something that seems quite light is something that can turn into something quite serious quite quickly um, so we code for verbal sexual harassment we code for um, non-verbal sexual harassment that can be threatening in terms of its physical thing like stalking or being chased or followed. There's also things like being uh, having someone masturbate in front of you, being shown digital pornography on public transport, and then of course all the way through to physical forms of sexual harassment. Um, but as Jill has really interestingly pointed out, someone... I mean, we, we always assume that physical sexual harassment is the worst kind of thing that can happen to you. But if you hear Jill talk about it, she will tell you that someone patting you on the bottom actually may not be as scary as being curb crawled or followed home or being chased. So this, we've really got to think very carefully about how we understand these reports and the categorisation of them. Um, and we certainly have very deep data that I'd be happy to share with you about the definitions and then about how they kind of play out 
um, for, for young women at least. Yeah, so just um, adding to uh, what uh, Nicole, Nikki mentioned. So for the study that I was involved um, in with Carolyn, so how we define it is based on the UN definition. So it can encompass that whole, you know, catcalling or you just, you know, looking at, looking at you like in, 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 in a way yep. that you, know, you don't feel comfortable up to, you know, rape and assault. So the whole, uh, but we've... Um, kind of categorize it into three is, uh, you know, physical, nonverbal, and verbal. Mm. Um, and across that, three transport environments as well. And the three transport environments has been defined by um, Anastasia Lukaitu Sideris as part of that whole 17-city um, um, comparison study. So a book is coming out next year to kind of um, encompass that study in the different cities. Up here, there's a question. Yep. Thank you very much for your presentations. I um, have the pleasure of working in the construction industry like Natalie and um, I have had a role to play on the cultural task force there too. One of the things that we focus on, um, including in the National Association of Women in Construction, which is a professional association of which I'm a director, is behaviour. Um, and I wondered to the extent, or could you talk a little bit about um, how the work that you do in architecture could have an impact on the behaviour of perpetrators rather than just, as an example, the safety of women? How, and how, how does the way that you design public transport infrastructure, including the vehicle um, and the train stations, how, how does that have the potential to modify the behaviours that we want to change? Mm. I mean, I think that the, a really important part of understanding public transport space, and I was going to say it a bit earlier, is that so architecture and design can't solve dreadful behaviour and random acts of sexual violence. Um, but what I think we need to understand is that the research that we've been doing at the XYX Lab really closely aligns the fact that there's a tendency for particular behaviour to occur in particular typologies. So therefore we can't assume that there's no relationship. So certainly the street is dominated, but public transport, because of its proximities, of, of the proximity of bodies, becomes a place where perpetrators actually um, you know, that, that's an, an, a very active place for them. So we also then have to assume that there are things that we could do that have a kind of spatial consequence that might start to change that. And certainly a really basic one like overcrowdedness um, is, is one that we can see might affect the capacity for perpetrators to act anon anonymously and to kind of get away with the things that they're doing. Um, so I think, though, that we also have to understand that um, spaces shape behaviours as well and that there's a relationship between them. So to only think about the material architecture as a mistake and to also only think about spaces as being objects and artefacts is also a mistake. One of the biggest things we know works is communication campaigns, telling both the perpetrators that their behaviour is unacceptable and, and hopefully in, in very good cities, illegal, um, also what the consequences are, you also need to tell women and girls what sexual harassment is because young girls are so used to being sexually harassed, mm -hmm. over a third of them are so used to it that they see it as a normal part of navigating city life. So you have to define it so that they have an expectation that it's unacceptable. So communication campaigns are, a, are one of the uh, really successful things that we can do. Again, not architecture per se, but part of the shaping of space. Mm -hmm. I think to that end, and for those of you who are visiting Melbourne, um, the Respect Victoria public transport campaign, I think, has been very successful. Um, and for those of you who haven't had the um, pleasure of seeing the posters of, you know, two mm. blokes, they happen to be, but friends on a tram, one of them's ogling a woman and the other one has, says, hey, don't do that, leave her alone. Well, um, mm. Very short, sharp conversation, but no pain is felt, I think, and they've called it out. Mm. I think that... Um so there's no evidence to suggest how successful that campaign is yet. Uh, and it is kind of relying on a bystander mentality, which is this whole thing that we're seeing a lot at the moment. Men step up and step in and do something. There are criminologists who will tell you that when you do intervene, it can be very dangerous. We also know that drivers can't intervene because they're not allowed to from a legal OH&S point of view. So I think it would be interesting to see how that campaign does play out. Um, but yeah, it is on public transport, and that is certainly a good thing. Did you want to add something, or go to another question? Then? There are lots there of questions. Yeah, that's a question. Uh, 
Hi, um, I'm just following off that previous questions, um, probably for um, more you, Nicole. Um, I've read your um, book in PhD, Hypersexual Cities. You and my mother have, that's very good. Yeah, <laughs> it's very good. Um, I was just wondering, like, when you, yeah, when you're speaking about, like, yeah, I guess, like, media space, I think you, mm. you use that term in, in your book, and it's talking about how, for example, um, you know, advertisements and even, um, yeah, advertisements either mobile, like, moving or stationary affect, um, I guess, how, you know, how identities essentially, like, interact with each other. Mm. Um, what, like, like, for example, there's one of the Calvin Klein ad, um, like how much power, I guess, and influence do you have or even um, like what department, like I know, you know, that it's a whole, you know, it's advertising, it's PR, marketing, you know, architecture isn't in that. Like we have, like what, um, how much like power and how much like say do we have to, to change something like that, if that makes sense? Mm. Well, I think that, um, so I'm a middle-aged person writing about hypersexualized advertising in public spaces and... I was actually really surprised when we started working with young women that they actually called that out as well. So women talk about standing in a tram stop next to a hypersexualized advertisement and being curb crawled and sexually harassed. And they understand that there's a proximity between that kind of booby sexualized image, them standing there as a sitting duck and waiting, mm -hmm. as Durley said, and this kind of triangulation that occurs. Um, and actually, we also can see internationally that some cities are banning hypersexualized advertisement. Uh, and one of the key things that I think we're exploring in this workshop next week is whether or not there's um, a, a capacity for us to... I mean, we actually think that there should be no hypersexualized advertising in ad tram stops or in public transport spaces because of the expectations that start to arise from that. We start to expect women to behave in particular ways when she's standing alongside a hypersexualized image. And if we can avoid that, why wouldn't we? So um, I think there's... A, I think that... There will be media people that say there's so much advertising that we see none of it. But I think we'd be stupid to assume that there's not some kind of gendered, stereotypical um, uh, stuff that happens within urban spaces when we're surrounded by images like that, particularly in typologies where sexual harassment is prolific. So um, it's certainly something that we're exploring in the work that we do. Thank you. We'll take one more question that's just here and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, I'm interested in knowing uh, what are your suggestions for uh, training and gender sensitization of the police and uh, the drivers and all other agencies which are on the periphery of transport? Mm. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm, this is more of a personal view of mine rather than a um, you know, evidence-based kind of suggestion or recommendation. So I think it's, it's really important uh, to have um, some kind of competence on, and respect as well. I think respect is very important and um, inculcating a culture of respect takes time and we need to, you know, start somewhere. It's not about, I think, yes, we need to kind of look at, you know, how media advertises and, and, and I think that's one of the way that we can intervene, but at the same time, really it's about that changing behavior towards increasing respect and coming up with strategies to support that. And it could be, you know, through trainings and uh, yeah, some kind of competence. Yeah. I think the, just very quickly, the major thing that is happening at the moment is that women are reporting to PSOs and to police and they're not taken seriously and women don't yeah. report for that exact reason. So if we mandate gender sensitive training for every person that is working in a public transport space so they know how to respond to a disclosure of sexual harassment or assault in a gender sensitive way that's appropriate, that allows women to feel believed and... Um, includes all of those gender issues that we know need to happen when women want to report, then we're in a much better place to start to gather accurate data about what's happening. So, um, and it can't just be, you know, an online fucking thing that you just do for 20 minutes and you've done it and it's over. It has to be ongoing. It, I mean, the technology around... Um, uh, just that the, there's a lot of gender harassment that's happening in, in through technology now. So we, we can't just kind of do it once and not expect to be doing it over and over again. And so it has to be something that happens regularly. Yeah. 
Just wanted to add as well. Um, so with the study, when we were, co we were comparing, you know, Melbourne as well as um, Metro Manila and the other cities, what was interesting to see was the reporting um, habit. So it was quite high here in Melbourne. So I think 70% reported to the police. But what was interesting in Manila, almost no one reported. And it would be reporting to their families rather than anyone else. And it's because of the lack of trust on you know the system. And I think yeah, th we need to kind of improve that. Well, thank you both very much for a really insightful presentations that you made. And I think while we were focused mainly on gender equity, there were lots of other equity considerations that got raised to do with age, life stage, um, sustainability, culture, um, you know, developing versus developed countries. So I think that was really important. And thank you also for your questions. It's is there one last thing you wanted to, to say that you feel you haven't said before we mm -hmm. close? Was that one last message? Or Sorry, or mm. I think we've probably covered it all, but I want to give you that opportunity in case. Yeah, I think it's 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 really about developing a, a respectful mm. culture where we can trust in, with one another to, um, you know, us to, to lead us to a more inclusive city. Mm. I think. Yeah. yeah, and I guess another key message was that. There might be some short-term answers yeah. and then some, some longer-term ones as well. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs> Thank you.